whatever you choose to do, it's because you want to do it and you're not only doing it for the paycheck. So when you have that option, to me, you have you have reached a level of freedom and financial independence and that I think everyone should be like working towards. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Hey, hey guys, welcome, welcome back to the show. Today in the guest chair, we have Jamila Soufront. Jamila is a certified financial education instructor, a podcaster of Journey to Launch podcast, a writer, and the founder of journeytolaunch.com, where she shares her journey to reaching financial independence while helping others to do the same. Jamila is considered a go-to financial thought leader in the personal finance field and is the resident financial expert on a weekly segment on News 12, the most watched local TV news station in NYC. She's also been featured in Essence, Money Magazine, CNBC, CBS, Business Insider, and more. And here's what's most impressive to me about Jamila. Jamila and her husband saved $169,000 in two years and are completely debt-free besides their mortgage. She is also a mother of three small children and lives in NYC, okay? One of the most expensive places ever, and they still managed to save this much. So this episode is going to be a little bit different than most. Yes, Jamila is a side hustler turned full-time entrepreneur, so she still meets that criteria, but her pathway to making that leap is a little bit different. Quitting her job to work for herself was made possible not by just monetizing her side hustle, but by saving. Yes, I said saving. Jamila and her husband saved enough to give her the runway to quit her job and have time to figure things out without the pressure of being strapped for cash. It's a model I think that we can all learn from the power of saving and having that nest so you don't have anxiety and stress about paying your monthly expenses on top of trying to grow your business. It's huge. I hear a lot of my guests talk about quitting with a little bit of money saved and the stress that that put on them and how they had to figure everything out really fast. And that's not a model I want to glorify, actually. I really think we can all optimize our money and prepare and have a plan, work the plan, like I always say, And so that's why I really wanted to share Jamila's story with you. I know that a lot of you might also just want to leave your job for a better job and you don't have it lined up yet, but you're tempted to quit with no plan B. And I'm here to show you her, Jamila, because she is someone who had those same thoughts about quitting. You know, she even Googled it as she will share in this episode. But instead of doing that, she decided to get really strategic about saving. She has done an amazing job with this. So I won't go on any further. Let's get right into it. So welcome to the guest chair, Jamila. Thank you so much for having me, Nikayla. Thank you for being here. Long overdue. Like I said, you know, we chatted offline. I've been dying to get you in the guest chair because I, first of all, just admire your journey. I'm like, how does she do this? And I think it's so important. And we all need to talk about money a little bit more. We could all be a little bit smarter about how we approach this entrepreneur thing, especially as we continually see headlines about us not being able to raise money or get money and all this stuff like let us have our own money how can we optimize our money so you are going to be our guru and guide us through this a little bit (laughs) (laughs) happy happy to share what I know and what I'm learning yes okay so first things first give us just a peek into the life of Jamila who are you when were you bitten by the entrepreneurship bug yeah so okay I am Jamila Born in Jamaica, the island, not the um, borough. No, no offense to I always say anyone. That, not the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I always have to say Gotta that. Make it clear. But you know, <laughs> it, it, when I have to say that because it shaped me being like an immigrant um, and being born to a single mom. So my mom had me at a young age, and she came over to United States to Brooklyn first before she sent for me 
a few months later, like that really shaped the person who I am today, I believe. And watching her like come to this country without anything, work hard as a young mom. And now that I'm a mom of three, I'm just like, I don't know how she did it Uh, because, you know, I have way more resources and help than she did. And she still just found time to pour into me. And so I'd say that I am a girl that always had big dreams and hopes. And I've always been really motivated and I've always wanted to be my own boss. I always kind of, you know, marched to the beat of my own drum and I didn't like anyone telling me what to do. I always had that like fiery spirit. And so when I graduated from college and I got my first time like job and I was working full time, I I felt like I knew right away like this was not going to be my life or at least I, I didn't want it to be like my life until I was 60. I felt like, you know what, I have some years. I gave myself until I was 30. So when I graduated from college, I was 22. And I remember saying, by the time I am 30 years old, I will be working for myself or I'll be a millionaire. I don't know how, but I'll figure it out. And um, actually, I didn't. (laughs) I did not figure (laughs) it out. I did not figure it out, Nikayla. Um, So it was funny because I had these hopes and dreams. I'd look at like the people uh, who worked in, you know, the office who were older and they just looked miserable. And I was like, that will never be me. Mm -hmm. But as many, I'm sure some of your listeners who are still like side hustling can attest to, like when you start working, you get that consistent paycheck and you try things. So I tried a couple of businesses in my 20s because I thought, you know what, I have to start something. I have to do something really big for this to work. And so I tried a couple of things. I like tried an online magazine. I um, actually got into the vending machine business for a little bit. I tried to get my real estate. (laughs) Yes. I tried to get my real estate license and all those things just did not. I didn't see how that would be a clear runway for me to never work in corporate America again or work for myself. And so it wasn't until I was pregnant. So I passed my 30 year old mark. I was like still working and I really really got motivated to figure it out once I was pregnant and had a like this horrible, horrible commute, which really just prompted me to say, okay, Jamila, like now there's no games right now. You're about to have your first child. You don't want to be stuck in an office for the rest of your life or in the car for four hours a day. Right. You got to figure something out. It, isn't it funny how a lot of us think that when we think of entrepreneurship or just like what we can do to work for ourselves, leave our job. We think we have to come up with like the next big idea. Like, oh, it has to be big. And then we do it for a little bit and we're like, oh, I'm, I'm not a millionaire yet. <laughs> this is not going to be it. <laughs> right, right. It's It can definitely be just a little daunting to, if you don't know the different avenues you can take to become wealthy and financially secure. Um, But there are so many other avenues. And that's kind of like what I figured out was like, wow, like I can actually do this by just being smarter with my finances. And yeah, so that really helped figuring that part out. And when did you become so into money? Like not everyone is good with their money. Like even from a young age, you might be that person who your parent gives you money and, you know, you keep the change or you spend it all. You're like, I'm going to find something for every single one of these dollars and then there's some of us who like you know actually start putting things away in a piggy bank which one were you so I was the child where we didn't have a lot of material things growing up but I didn't grow up wanting for anything you know my mom was very simple and she didn't have a lot of money but what she did have she would try to spend on experiences so I think I grew up valuing experiences over things and so when she could she put me in gymnastics class I was the only black girl in gymnastics you know (laughs) kind of thing and so I had those experiences which really helped for me to see like the bigger picture of things so I feel like that helped and one of the things that she actually um, reminded me and I have a memory of this is she took me to open up my first savings account at around six years old. And I actually remember, yeah, I remember that. And, you know, she didn't know about investing. So she, she didn't know about like talking to me about budgeting or investing or growing my money. But the one thing, and, you know, she and my grandmother always did was they tried to save. So they didn't want to live paycheck to paycheck. They didn't have like glamorous jobs either. It's not like they were making a lot of money. My my grandmother um, watched kids, you know, she was an older lady when she came here. So not much that as an older immigrant you can do as a woman. So usually you clean houses or you watch kids. So she started watching kids. My mom, like really, she worked at fast food restaurants while she went to school. So I think seeing that, seeing them work so hard and then hearing them say to me, you know, if you get a dollar, you save 50 cents. Like they always just instill that to me. That has been kind of my foundation about money is that I've always been a saver, Mm -hmm. but I didn't always necessarily do, you know, the best and optimize things with my money. I didn't really start learning how to do that really honestly until um, my late 20s, early 30s. Okay. 
So I remember you saying you got that first job at like around 14 and actually saving that paycheck, which stood out to me because I remember when I got my first job, they actually had like a a place where you could cash your check right on site. <laughs> it was so mm-hmm. crazy. It was like, mm-hmm. and then all the interns, like that's what, that's what we did. We we're like, paycheck, let's go cash it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah. Well, but you did the opposite. Yeah. So even I got my first job at 14. I've been working ever since. And I mean, I did spend money. So it's not like I just never spent money. And, you know, like I was the perfect steward of everything. But I remember saving my checks, even as like a 14 year old, 15 year old. And where it really paid off is when I got into um, college and I got an inroads internship. So that's when okay. like, you get an internship at like a Fortune 500 company and then they pay you like for what, you know, a 20, a 19 year old good money. And I remember that really was like, put me on a great starting path because I saved a lot of those checks in the summertime. And because of that, that's kind of how I was able to buy my first condo out of school because I've had some of that saved up already. Um, And I don't know, it was just something internally me. Again, it was like pushed down from my grandmother to my mother, save your money. um, And I just kept with that. And that's amazing. Can you tell us a little about buying that first condo coming out of undergrad? Because that's like, that's really young. So, you know, I was looking to buy real estate and the reason was, and this is why it's so important to be surrounded by like people or things that you like want to do. Because sometimes a lot of people just don't know it's possible. And so for me, I was in college and I had realized that this house that my grandmother bought years ago, she bought it and it had appreciated like a lot. Because when she bought it, no one wanted to live in the area. It was Fort Greene, you know, in Brooklyn. And there was just not a lot going on. And then by the time I was in college, like it was just, it was worth so much. And I said to myself, if my little old grandmother who could care less about real estate could buy something and it, she's like a little real estate mogul. She doesn't even know it or doesn't even <laughs> care. <laughs> I should surely be able to do something. And that's yeah. what kind of got me interested in looking around. And I remember it was like the height of the real estate boom. Um, and I couldn't afford anything. I wanted a brownstone because that's the other thing. I saw. I saw people in the neighborhood who yeah. owned multifamily units. And what and year was people, this? Was this like 06, 08? Yeah, this was around. Um, so this was like around 05, 06. I have to mm-hmm. go back and check my dates. I feel like I'm getting so old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was definitely like it was around the time where it was like every, the market was like hot and it was like so hard to buy a brownstone. And, you know, in retrospect, you know, the prices are even more ridiculous today. But I remember looking around and I saw a couple of people in the neighborhood, older people, and they had bought homes again at the time when nobody wanted to buy it. So they now were realizing that their property values had appreciated. They they weren't paying for their own mortgage because the rent rental units were doing it. And because I saw that firsthand, I knew that it was possible. And because I also have that kind of attitude where all it takes is for me to see one person doing it. And I'm like, oh, wait a second. I need to figure out how to do this too. And that's kind of what really prompted me to look into buying property. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't afford anything. I couldn't afford a brownstone. I mean the only thing I could almost afford because I really couldn't afford the condo either was I saw this new development in a place called Dumbo, which even though I grew up maybe like 10, 15 minutes from there, I'd hardly ever been. And when I went there, it was pre-construction and they had studios to like the penthouse and the cheapest thing or the most, the least expensive was like a, you know, $300,000 about studio apartment. And I said, well, comparing to like the multi-units or the the multi-family that's like they want to charge $800,000 for, you know, this $300,000 studio seems a little bit more like, you know, something I can manage. And that's kind of what made me realize or made me want to buy it because I thought I don't think I could afford anything else. And long story short, it ended up working out because that studio, by the time I closed on it, so I bought it pre-construction, put some money down. And my mom, thank God, like, despite her humble beginnings, was able to also gift me money for a down payment. I always have to say that because I feel like I don't want to leave that part of the story out because I've had such great support system. And, you know, even though she didn't have much, she she saved to a point where she could give her daughter, you know, like a starting point. And so with that, I was able to lock down, you know, the 10 percent. And then the interesting story about that is it took two years to build. So I saved the. Yeah. So it took two years for that apartment to be completed. So in order to save that, like to save my spot to like go into contract, I had to find the 10 percent. Right. So I found that 10 percent part from what I saved in my internship, partly from what my mom gave me. But to end up closing on it in two years, I would need additional 10 percent and then all the closing costs. Wow. Yeah. So but I hustled. So I started working full time right after I signed that contract. And What was your career path? Were you also working in finance? 
Yeah. So I'd graduated from college at that point and went straight to working. And again, here's this is where support does help. Um, and it gave me a, a better footing because my mom allowed me to live at home. And I, I saved about like 90 percent of my paycheck mm-hmm. because I knew in two years I would need the additional 10 percent, which at the time was about like thirty eight thousand dollars. Yeah. And also um, the closing costs like I would need that cash that was all going to be on me. And so when I worked for the additional two years, like I saved a majority of my checks and I was working in the finance field. So I, I started I got that offer for a full time job through the same company I interned for. Okay. So knowing that allowed me to, and just like knowing that I had two years to do it, I saved every single thing that I could. And by the time that the condo did close, because that was also a risk, because here's another thing. When you looked at what I was going to make in two years versus what the mortgage would be, it was barely covering actually the mortgage. And so that was going to also be a risk because if I had to like go through a whole like, you know, getting the mortgage and they would have evaluated my circumstances, they would have said, wait, wait a second, Jamila, like technically on paper, you can't afford this. But again, it was the real estate bubble bubble, and they were doing no loan doc closings, mm-hmm. which again, so for a lot of people that was horrible because they got things they couldn't afford and it went bust. But for me, because they did no loan doc closings, they gave me the mortgage, which I probably shouldn't have gotten at the time. And I was able to close on it, but I felt secure doing it because they just, you know, the property had appreciated by the time I closed on it before, more than what I had put went into contract for it. So I knew by then that it was a win anyway, because I could either sell it at a profit or I can rent it out and at least have it cover the mortgage. And which did you go with? So I ended up closing on it. And luckily for me, I had, you know, was still working and I'm talking about hustling 90 percent of my check over two years. I mean, I was, that that yeah. already sounds crazy. So, yeah. And my expenses were super low. I was living at home. I had commuting expenses. But again, I was very diligent with how I saved. And so by the time I closed, I also just had a little buffer to help cover expenses that the work like my check couldn't cover with the expectation that over time my income would increase because, you know, you're working in a job. I worked in corporate America. You get bonuses every year and then you get like annual increases. So I knew if I could just stay like diligent and on path, like in a couple of years, I would be OK. And that's kind of like the risk I took. And it ended up ended up working out. And you still have that property to this day. Yes. So the good thing about it is I still have that property and I rent it out. You see, you see, guys, this is what I'm talking about. So Jamila is going to break down all the different ways that she saves in a bit. We're going to get into that. But I really first just want to know, when did you become interested in the FI movement? And what exactly does FI mean in your own words? Right. That's a good question. So the FI movement, the financially independent movement, and they sometimes you add on RE, retire early. I first got interested when I was pregnant with my first son. So this same job that I had that my intern did with, I commuted to. So I lived in Brooklyn and I commuted to New Jersey. And that was about an hour, an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the day and, you know, the traffic patterns. But when I was pregnant with my first son um, in 2014, I this like all the it was just crazy traffic. It took me four hours to get home that day. It was like insane. And I remember being in my car, like having a breakdown. So not only am I like in the car for four hours, but I'm pregnant. I'm just like over it. And I said to myself that day, like, there's no way that I'm going to like work at a job like this Mm -hmm. or be on the road like this, like raising a family. Like there is no way. Like, And I think before what happened was I I got kind of comfortable. And so, you know, I was making I was making good progress in my job. I was doing really well. I um, I also had bought my condo. And so there was a lot of things like that were good. It's like I never want to say like that job really allowed me to do so much. And so I think I got really comfortable. But I think having and knowing that I wanted to start a family, what like I knew I wanted more. And I just started like Googling, how do I quit my job? <laughs> like, how do I retire early? <laughs> because I'm familiar then, you know, with that Google search. <laughs> I, I'm sure we all have tried that. And so because I tried to start all these, like not all these other businesses, but, you know, I tried things that didn't work. It wasn't even like I was looking at like how to start a business. It was more just like, how do I quit my job? And I found like blogs and podcasts about this thing, which I didn't even know was a thing that people were saving and investing their money. And it wasn't an immediate thing that happened, but they saved it over five, 10, 15 years. And then they had the option to quit their corporate job or retire early, depending on what their goals were. And I said, wait a second, like my worst case scenario should be this. So let's just say like, I don't think of a business between now and the time I'm 50. But if we can, like my husband and I, if we can figure out a way to save and invest and be smart with our money, 
over time, we like the worst case scenario is that I could leave my job or if my husband wanted to leave his job, we could. And so that's what really got me excited because I was like, this, these are everyday people, you know, some are earning six figures, some medium salaries, but they are making, they're finding a way to like live their life without having to necessarily be millionaires right away. They can, they invested and saved to become millionaires. And I was like, okay, that's what I want to do. Now, what does it mean in your own words? So for me, being financially independent means that I have flexibility to choose when I work, how I work and how I spend my time. And so when I said it, when I first started my journey and I said I wanted to retire by age 40, I knew that I wanted to work. I think what trips people up is when they hear that whole phrase, the financial independent retire early. They're they're just like, what do you mean? Like, you're going to retire and do what at 30? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Five, right. Like I want to work. And the thing is like, it's okay. Like I want to work too. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I want to, you know, I think life is about bringing your purpose into the world and working. So it's more about choosing though, what you want to do. So whether that is like you want to work in corporate America because you love your job or you want to volunteer or you want to work in Trader Joe's, I don't know. It doesn't matter, but whatever you choose to do, it's because you want to do it and you're not only doing it for the paycheck. Yes. So when you have that option, to me, you have you have reached a level of freedom and financial independence and that I think everyone should be like working towards. So once you found out about the whole FI or FI movement, what did you do next? And, you know, was your husband on board right away? <laughs> so I remember when I first Um, started telling him about it. She was looking at me like, what are you like talking about? Because (laughs) (laughs) I became obsessed. So the good thing about, and this is what I always say, if you're working in a job or doing something right now that you're not completely like happy with, you find the silver lining, you turn everything into an opportunity. And so I had that long commute. It was an hour and a half about sometimes two one way, which gave me a lot of time in my car to listen to a lot of podcasts. And so I went down like the rabbit hole of all these personal finance, financial independence podcasts where I heard stories. It, won't, it was almost like I was like almost changing my reality. I was like almost obsessed reading blogs, listening to podcasts. And so I started hearing like stories and how people were figuring out how to do it and saving more. So I remember I used to send him stuff and he used to be like, like, what does this mean for me? Like, you're talking about people who are saving like 50 percent of their income. Like, are you talking? Are you saying that we now need to do that? And like, we can't like enjoy going out to eat and all these things. So at first he was a little bit looking at me like I was crazy. Right. But <laughs> when I started to talk to him more and I think it was like these real deep conversations of, OK, let's forget about like what someone else's path looks like. What can our path look like? And it took some conversation, but I, I really, really wanted to like let him understand that this was just not something that I was just going to do without him being on board. It was only going to work if we both agreed and were on board to do it. And that took like conversations. It took asking him, this question was important. I asked him, you know, what does a good life look like right now? And what does a good life look like in 20 years? You know, by then, I think we also were on our second kid. So I said, you know, when our kids are like, you know, 20, like, what do we want our life to look like? Do we still want to have to work or do we want to be able to, you know, travel more? And so we kind of like made lists and, and brainstormed and talked about that. And I said to him, like, let's figure out a way to to reasonably have the, both of those scenarios. And I having that kind of mindset around it helped us craft with our finances, like how we could do that. I love that. And the reason I love that is because I think that saving and figuring out what to do with your money can be intimidating, which is why a lot of people end up squandering it. It's almost easier to just get that instant gratification. You immediately see where your money is going to. But then at the same time, like I want us to break down all the different ways we can put away our money. We can get it to work for us and we can just make smarter decisions so that in the 20 in the next 20 years, our life can look like what we really want it to look like. And so, you know, my next question, I want us to break down how you guys saved in a, in a little bit. But I also want to just kind of emphasize because I really can't drill this point home enough. Um, I love your definition of FI because I think the greatest gift in life will be being able to choose how you spend your time without having to ask anyone for permission. And there's nothing wrong with working somewhere. But what if you had the leverage and the flexibility because you know you could walk away at any moment to say, here is what I'm going to (laughs) do. Mm -hmm. Here's how many vacation weeks I am going to take, you know, and I will need. Imagine if you just have the leverage to structure your life a little bit more the way you want to, because you you know that you can walk away. 
And so that is a power I wish for all of us. So now, Jamila, can you break down? I see these headlines. I see that you guys <laughs> saved, what was it, 169000 in two years? Yeah. I Okay. <laughs> We got to yes, get yes. into I'll, the nitty gritty. Yes, I'm talking I know, about I'm one of those people. 401k, 403b <laughs> investment properties. Let's go. <laughs> I know. I'm one of those people. I know it's like you see those headlines and you yeah. roll your eyes like, really? Like, I'm no, just trying to no, tell, pay off some school more. Debt. <laughs> Like percentage you put in, maxed out, all of that. <laughs> okay. So I want to definitely be clear about a, a few things, right? Okay. Um, I want to be clear that I know it's easy to compare, um, and but everything is relative. Mm-hmm. And so the amount that we were able to save and invest was a function of the fact that we didn't have debt by that point. So we had paid off our debt, which meant that, except for the mortgages that we have, which meant that we could then now really use all of any cash flow or income that came in and we could decide where it went. It didn't have to go back to like the bank to pay for a car note or credit card. So that's really important. Quick note on that. So would you recommend um, paying off your debt first? And you're talking about student loan debt here or what debt are you talking about? So consumer like debt, that's high interest rate debt. So credit card debt um, is usually like the highest for most people. And then you have things like car loans, depending on the percentage rate. And then student loan debt, yes, is one of the things that you can pay off. But for some people, I, I think it's it depends on your situation because some people have like six figures worth of student loan debt. Um, so it, that situation may look a little bit different. But essentially, yes, you should be working to pay off your debt. Doesn't mean you can't start investing. And so the, the one of the ways. So the biggest thing about our journey and like how I like to frame it for people is one, it's relative and it's based on what the fact that we didn't have debt. So we could put more money, more of our money towards investing and saving. And that's huge for people, right? Because imagine for some people, if they didn't have like a thousand dollar credit card, like payment or debts to pay back, they'd have a lot more money to invest, right? Mm-hmm. And the other function of that is that we we earned decent incomes. And I'm saying earned as past tense. So we earned <laughs> these, <laughs> um, as like a couple. He, you know, my husband's a teacher and he was able to supplement his income by coaching and doing some things. I worked in corporate America. So I had, you know, a pretty good job. So I like to just make sure that that is like just on the table. So people can really understand that like for our position and what we were able to do was like we had, there was a reason we were able to do that, do it that way. But okay. that's not to say because there's a lot of people who earn six figures and can't save, you know, Ten dollars. Right. So it's really more about your situation. But now when I say or we say that we saved one hundred and sixty nine thousand, a majority of that was in our pre-tax retirement accounts. And so that looks like a 401k. So when I was working, I had access to a 401k. My company also matched me a certain percentage. And so one of the things I found out about this whole FI movement was there was a thing for teachers and um, most people, not most, but some people who work for like the city or state, they have access to two pre-tax retirement accounts. So what does that mean? That means you can put money away before the government taxes that money. And as a teacher, my husband had options to invest into two separate ones, which was a game changer because like an average person can only invest in one and max out one. So right now the limit for that is like Mm 19,000. And so my husband, and but at the time it was, I believe 18,000. So at the time we figured out that he could save $36,000 in his pre-tax retirement accounts. And I could save also $18,000 in my 401k. Now, obviously we had to do a lot of um, changing to our budget to make that happen because now that a lot of our money was going to be diverted into these retirement accounts. But that was a major way that we did it is that we basically, we we set our saving and investing limit. My thing was let's max out every tax advantage account that we have to us. So that was, you know, my 401k, his pre-tax stuff, which was a 43B and a 457 plan. And then we had Roth IRAs, which we earned a little bit more that we had to do backdoor Roth. So I don't want to like get too convoluted, but we were able hey, to... Oh no, we can get convoluted okay. here. We're smart people. Now, what is a Roth... What is a backdoor Roth IRA? What you talking about? Okay, okay. <laughs> Good. All right. So with the, with the retirement accounts, you have pre-tax. So that means that before the government gets their piece, you can put that away. So you save, you save on taxes when you do that. Um, post-tax or after-tax are things like a Roth IRA. So that means the, the, the government already took their taxes from it and now you get this money and you can invest it. But when you go to take it out in retirement, it's not taxed because it was already taxed. The one thing you should know is that the government is always going to like get its taxes some way or the other. <laughs> so whether you're paying taxes now or later, um, they're going to get it on the other end, right? And so we were able to invest in backdoor Roth IRA. So at a certain income level, you start to get phased out in where you can directly invest in a Roth IRA. So it's something called a backdoor Roth IRA and it's totally, it's not illegal. (laughs) It's like totally legal where 
if even if you have a higher income limit, you can still invest in the Roth and then you do a traditional Roth and then you convert it to a Roth, a Roth IRA and then it becomes like a backdoor Roth IRA. Okay. So it's something that we were able to do. And because we were investing in all these like tax advantage accounts, that was a majority. That was, I would say, about almost half of the money okay. over the two years. And then additionally with that, it was, you know, saving the bonuses. It was saving in taxable investments. So this and these are not retirement retirement accounts. These are just, you know, opening up a taxable account where I'm in, investing in index funds. Um, so we were, it was like a hodgepodge of investments accounts that we use, but a majority and the focus was on the tax advantage accounts. And did your real estate property come into play at all? Like, were you saving the money from that or was that going to paying bills while you saved your income? Right. So the real estate property by then, the more, the rent for that property exceeded the mortgage. So there was a bit, there was some overlay, there was some profit there where we could take then and put towards saving, like paying down our current mortgage and or just investing it. And what kind of changes did you make to your lifestyle? I mean, um, from what you're saying, so you guys... One year you're using most of this money, you know, saving maybe three to six percent, whatever the the average is in your retirement accounts. And then you just completely up that rate. So what had to change? Yeah. And that's a good question. So and this is for anyone who's looking to do something like more with their saving and investing. The first thing we had to do was to figure out like a budget. So before that, we didn't really have a budget. You know, we were doing pretty well, like in terms of income. So it's like, oh, we go out to eat when we want. Like we do this when we want. And it's not that we were huge spenders. So I think that was actually pretty good. So it's not like we both like shopped a lot, but we just we definitely didn't have like limits or we weren't that conscious about the way we spent. Mm -hmm. And so the first couple of things that we did to allow us to do this was one, we um, made saving and investing a priority. And so that's it was easier to do with the um, pre-tax stuff. So like working at a job, if you increase your percentage to that 401k, it comes out before you see your check. So when I said, okay, I want to eventually max out my 401k. So instead of, you know, only contributing like 500, uh, three, $500 a, a month, I want to contribute like 1500 or like a month. Like, let's just say, right. What happens is when I got my check, like that was my check. And so I, we had to budget what was left with that check. Now, it's important to understand that if you're going to do that, you can afford your living expenses. But that's where kind of the budget came in, where it's like, OK, we set our saving and investing goals. Then we make things as automatic as we can. And when we started to max everything out, what came home at the end of the day after we set our goals and our targets was what we had left to live on. And we had to make that work. And so it came a matter of, OK, what are our mandatory expenses? They're the mortgage. You know, they are groceries, they're commuting expenses. What are the nice to have? They're restaurants. They're, you know, getting my hair done, getting my nails done. And so things like that, where they were more discretionary, mm -hmm. we were able to look at and either cut or put some limits around it. Yes. And I find budgets to be so helpful in that, like, you're right, you can just you you could be good with money, but not really pay attention to how how much better you could be at managing it. Right. You can you can be really free with going out to drinks and going out to dinner. But when you have a budget, it's like, OK, um, this is what I have for the month. And it doesn't even have to be really strict. Right. I know, um, you know, I've heard other people say like they just have a slush fund and like this is how much is in it. And it goes for clothes. It goes for eating out. It goes for all of that. And once it's done, it's done. So it's not like you have to be overly rigid, but it truly helps to just keep your life in flow. And at the same time, you realize I didn't really need all that much. Having all that much that wasn't allocated to savings just caused me to spend more. Right, right. And that's why I would say most people should really look at like what their saving and investing goals could be. How far can you push that? And even like with my husband and I, like I knew that that was going to be a different, a big change. Like, you know, like what came home like every month, take home pay. And so we did it for him gradually because his check actually, because it was pre-tax, it was going to see the most. And because he was contributing to two retirement accounts, like his check would see like the most dramatic decrease. And so we did that a little gradually. I said, okay, let's do maybe 2% every month. And then I remember a couple of months later, he just came to me and said, let's just try it. Let's just do it automatically. Let's just like max it out and see what happens. And so that was a big, you know, it was a little uncomfortable, but that's the thing. Like, I think anything, any big change, any big leap is going to require you to be uncomfortable. Um, and we always said, like, we could always go back. So let's just say this is too uncomfortable. We right. find out we can't pay our bills. 
we can go back. But I wanted to go back to what you said, because I really like that. Like, I think for most people, like you don't understand the opportunity cost of like your habits or what you're spending on. Yes. And when I came home and I showed him, so I had a spreadsheet and I said to him, listen, if we are able to save, let's just say $50,000 a year, and let's say that 50,000 is broken out into pre-tax retirement accounts, Roth accounts, or just whatever, let's just say $50,000 a year. If we do that over the course of 15 years, this is how much money we can have. Like with the, you know, average market return and, you know, plug some numbers in, we can have, let's say $1.5 million. If we continue to do the same thing we're doing now and do the bare minimum, you know, only kind of invest like 10,000 or 5,000 or whatever it is we're doing, we'd only have 300,000. When I showed him like those numbers, when I saw those numbers, I was like, oh, we could have how much more money if we just like, you know, we did these things. Yes. And then the the real key too, which I think is really important, especially if you're not doing this alone and you have to like, you have to, you know, compromise with someone was, and I'm the same way. I'm not super frugal. You know, it's not like I, we never go out to eat. We live in New York city. We have three kids now. Um, and so it's not like we were like, oh, we're just never going out to eat again. We're never buying anything again. But it said, okay, let's put some limits around it. So instead of just going out to eat and spending maybe who knows what on restaurants and looking at it like, oh my gosh, it was like, we have a certain amount and we need to adhere to this amount. And every time we go over it, it's going to be dipping in to our saving and investing goal. And do is it worth that? Do we want to do that kind of thing? Yes. Hey guys, it's Michaela here with a quick word from our sponsors. Hey, hey, y'all. Second quarter of 2019 has officially begun. So tell me, what skill have you been meaning to work on that you haven't gotten to yet? Now is the time. And there's no better place than Skillshare to start learning and growing today. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators just like us. It has over 25,000 classes in subjects like photography, entrepreneurship, graphic design, writing, marketing, and even podcasting, you name it. I even created a course and you can take it, my How to Start Your Own Podcast course. It's on Skillshare so you can learn how to record, how to edit, how to publish your show and get started today as a podcaster. Huge thanks to Skillshare for supporting Side Hustle Pro with a special offer just for you. You can get two months of unlimited access to Skillshare for free. So sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro. Start working on your dreams today. That's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro to start your two months free right now. One last time, that's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle Pro. Now, at what stage did you know that not only were you saving, but you were saving to quit your job sooner than like the retire early forecast, right? Like that's like, okay, I can quit. I can retire at 40. At what stage did you start Journey to Launch and actually start thinking of making it your own business? Yeah. So at 33 is when I like, I kind of put my uh, flag in the sand and said, I'm going to work consciously towards like making this a reality where I would have, I could quit corporate America at 40 and do whatever I wanted, like, you know, and work on the things I wanted and not have to worry about money because we'd have enough saved and invested. You know, the goal was to pay off our mortgage by then. So we, ne- we wouldn't need as much cash flow. Like that was my whole plan um, at 33. And I started Journey to Launch to kind of chronicle that because I was like, okay, I'm listening to so many blogs and podcasts about this, but where's like a person like me talking about this? So I, that's part of the reason I did it was just to like, to, to show people and to show myself, okay, this is how it's going to be done. And the funny thing about it is as I started getting more into like journey to launch and, and that business, was, it was a blog when you started it, right? Yeah. So at first it was a blog where I was just like blogging every week, but then I was like, so into podcasts. I was like, why not just do a podcast? And I thought that I felt like that was easier for me to do, like to just speak instead of talk. Yeah. And, um, I started to see that, wait, journey to launch could be like something that helps me reach financial freedom and independence like way sooner. And it wasn't because it was like going to make a million dollars or make a lot of money. It was because one, I found like a passion that even if it just covers expenses or bills, like it wasn't even about the money anymore. It was the fact that now I could do something I loved and then have the freedom and the flexibility in my time to be with the people I loved, which is the whole idea of reaching financial freedom and independence anyway. And I think so what happened was I, I found out I was pregnant with my third child. Um, and I said to myself when that happened and Journey Songs was like really, it was really in a thick of things, like things were doing really well. The feedback was great. 
And I said to myself, okay, you can continue working and staying on this course, right? Like you can you have a good paying job. You can continue to like save and invest half your income and you'll reach your goals in five years. Or, um, but also you'd be miserable because now you have three kids, your commute is crazy. Even if I didn't work, like say I got a, a job closer to where I lived, I just would not be happy. Mm. Um, and so because I had this realization and because I got a, I had a taste of like doing work that I loved, I decided at that moment that the money wasn't as important as having the freedom. Um, and so we started to then make a plan to where I could quit my corporate job to focus on Journey to Launch full time, which really changed like everything. It kind of like threw our whole plan off track because, you know, instead of aggressively saving and investing for the last, next five years, yeah. now it was going to be, okay, now we need to save so we can cover expenses while you take this this leap of faith, while you take this kind of like break to focus on Journey to Launch. Right. And how did you deal with that mental shift? Because it's a shift from like, we'll have this much in the bank to we'll have this much and it's going to dwindle down for, you know, um, potentially this long while I work to get this off the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm a numbers girl and I had to do some calculations to feel comfortable, like and just mental work to feel comfortable. So one of the things that was important was one that we could we could afford our life today, like without any two major, you know, like changes. So we could afford to live where we lived. Um, if, cause if it was just me, you know, like I'd be like, all right, I'm moving back home or, you know, I I try to, (laughs) or I'll get roommates, like, right. Like it's easier to make like big shifts, but you know, I have a husband, I have three kids. There's a lot going on. Right. Uh And so I said to myself and, you know, to my husband, he had, obviously he had to be totally on board for this to happen at all. Like what, like what, makes us feel comfortable. And so I realized that if we could save enough money to where, so my husband still works and, but his income doesn't cover all of our expenses. And so I said, well, if we could save enough money and we call that like FU money and um, in the personal finance, financial independence space, because it's just like you have enough money to where you can walk away from something. And it's like, not that you're totally financially free, but you have enough money to like secure you. It's not, it's like an emergency fund on crack, like not just three, six months expenses, but it's like, it can, it can take you longer than that if needed. Yes. So I said to myself and to him, like, how much money do we have to have saved in order for where like your income is not covering everything, but we can pull from this FU fund and how long could that last? And so we figured out that we can aggressively save in like cash and like high yield savings accounts, um, about two years worth, two to three years worth of expenses that would cover what his income didn't cover. So not full on three years of total living expenses, but just uh-huh. the gap okay. that his income could not cover. So that was one. Could we could we accomplish that in the time that I wanted to leave my job? The second thing was, OK, because this this was a big shift. Like you said, for me, it was like, wow, like now you're not going to be investing like this, all this money over the next couple of years. Like, look how much your, you know, your investment portfolio doesn't grow. Yeah. But when I just left it as is. So when I did the calculation, like say we don't even contribute anything else to these accounts for the next 30 years, which is not going to happen. We're eventually going to start investing again. Because the biggest thing about this is in order to do this, we had to kind of pause all that investing into our retirement accounts. Okay. And then, then the priority became, let's save into cash and accessible accounts that we need so we can cover this kind of gap in my active corporate com- career. Um, and so once we figured out that like if we never contributed to the, our investments accounts again, our retirement accounts, just like leaving it there and letting it compound over time, we'd have enough money in our retirement accounts. Now, obviously it was not going to be as close to what it was if we kept on aggressively saving, but we'd be okay. Like we, you know, like it's not like in 50 years at 55, like we'd have like $10, like we'd have enough money to be okay. And so looking at that and realizing that like, it's not the end of the world, Like, let's say I do this for two years and I realize I don't love it or I don't want to do it or something happens. Like I could always go back to work So it was more about looking at this as what's the worst case and could we survive the worst case? And the answer was yes. Um, And so that's what really made me start to feel more comfortable um, is realizing that no matter what, like we'd be okay, and we could always go back if we needed to like get on like the right track again. And when you say this, so when you made that decision and you definitely knew, okay, I'm leaving my job by this date, what was the vision what what was the vision for your business and where do you see it going Mm, yeah so i you know i know that there are some people say oh you know you don't leave until you know that the business can like 
replace a certain amount of your income. But because I was pregnant and like there was a deadline, like I was having this baby in, like in May, like there was no like that was my deadline. I knew for sure that I wanted to have the option to not return back to work after maternity leave. And by that time when I was pregnant, it's not like, you know, I had a consistent revenue stream um, for Journey to Launch. You know, I did coaching, I did certain things, but it wasn't like consistent. But what I did see was that there was lots of possibility and there were lots of viable ways for me to make money. Now, the the major thing for me is that I didn't want to quit my job and start doing Journey to Launch. But like we had to had to like or like Journey to Launch had to make money because then I felt like that would then rush me to re- create products or services that just weren't aligned with right. what Journey to Launch was all about. So that's so it was also really huge for me to be able to at least cover journey to launch expenses and like not lose money. The biggest thing was like, let's just not have it lose money. <laughs> um, but I did see that there was an avenue for a lot of growth um, in a lot of areas in my business. So I was like, all right, let's make sure that we keep that momentum for, you know, I was, preg- I was grinding while I was pregnant. Like I was really like hustling, like working on journey to launch from, you know, as soon as the kids went to bed while I was pregnant up until two in the morning, because I wanted to make sure this was going to be a viable thing for me to launch into once I left. I mean, you are just so inspiring because, yeah, I was I would wonder. I was like, Jamila is working. Is she still pregnant? Like (laughs) (laughs) you, you really were grinding and still grinding with three kids. Like I look up to you so much. (laughs) Thank you. No, I mean, I think you don't have it. Sometimes like you don't have a choice, like your back is against the wall. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I have to make this work because it's either going back to work now with three little kids because my kids are pretty young too. They're like, you know, four, two, and then the the baby. And so I was just like, I I can't, this has to work. Um, So that's kind of why I had like the eye of the tiger (laughs) kind of mentality. And I want to call out you guys, what Jamila said, I think is so important and key is when you give yourself this runway as she was able to do with having, well, first of all, planning for it, recognizing, okay, how much are we going to need to cover the expenses and having that runway. So one, you don't have the same kind of stress. And two, you don't have to force yourself to do things that might not feel good for you, might not feel right for the business, but you're so pressed to make money that you're like, okay, I just got to, I got to figure this out kind of thing. Cause that's not a good mental space to be in to make serious business moves and to, to figure out a plan for your business. And, and keep in mind, your audience is seeing all this, right? So your mm-hmm. audience is going to remember when you did that shady thing. <laughs> Right. Or they're just like, oh, so now you quit your job and now you're just trying to sell us everything. Like, no, no, no. no. (laughs) People are not going to forget. So you cannot afford to be in that mental space. So this is why I really love Jamila's story. And I want to bring it to you guys so that you can see another way to go to market or just take time for yourself before launching your side hustle into your full time thing. Yeah. Can I just say something? Because I know yeah. I always try to like relate to people who maybe are not going to be in a situation like mine. Right. Let's uh-huh. just say you don't have a husband. You don't have someone like who's because, you know, at the end of the day, his income is helping now to sustain this kind of like this break in in employment for me. Um, but the things that I would say just for someone who's like not in that situation, who doesn't have like a second partner is, well, if you don't have like a second partner and it's just you, you can be a little bit more flexible. But and you can make a little bit more sacrifices and any sacrifices. I think, like, as you know, Nikayla, like to own your own business, especially to do it full time, yeah. like there's going to be sacrifices and how you and how you do it. And so it really just has to be a matter of, OK, what can we do to like lower our expenses? Do we need to cut out cable, cut out going out to eat, cut out these things for the these short term things for like the long term gain? Um, and I think that's important for anyone to like just put into perspective. Oh, yeah. And then did you work on um, testing monetization at all with with Journey to Launch before you left? Or has it been completely a new focus since you've gone full time? So I definitely I, I was, you know, I definitely tried things while I was working. So I, I, you know, I coached. So I had I knew that that could be a viable way to go about things. And I had the podcast so the podcast and monetizing that I knew was going to be a viable way for me. You know, it was all about I knew that in like two years, three years, like I can make this really viable because I knew my audience would grow as long as I felt like as long as I kept doing what I was doing and being true to the message and being true to my journeyers, like I knew that in a few years, like the audience level would be where it was. But at the moment, I knew that like I, I wasn't there yet. Yes. And so it really just said, I really had to say to myself, if you keep doing what you're doing, though, you'll get there. Um, So it's almost like that blind kind of faith. Like you, it's not blind because I knew that if I kept doing what I, what I was doing based on feedback, based on, you know, I got I got some 
you know, uh, sponsorship here and there. They weren't consistent, but I knew that if I could focus 100% and not have my attention split between the full-time job and the commute and the kids and all this, it's just like, all right, I have to pick a few things in my life to focus on. And I knew once I did that, then I'd be able to like focus on monetization in the right way. Um, you know, that would be better while I was just working and focusing on it full-time. And now that you have been um, out on your own full-time for a while now, what would you say, you know, describe Journey to Launch. What has it become? What It started as a blog, turned into a podcast. You have this whole community of journeyers. Tell us a little bit more about it and everything it entails. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Like it started as a blog, but now I now it's more like a personal finance, like media company. I'd say I like to also say it's like personal finance lifestyle because I also like with money, like I also get bored with just talking about budgets, like budgets <laughs> you know, like, yeah, whatever. Like the numbers are cool. Like I realize the numbers are a tool. Like it's yeah. great. You have to understand it to get what you want. But I like looking at like not only the bigger picture, but like it's bigger than that. It's not about the money. It's not about the budget. It's about, yes, you need to earn money. So my big thing is like helping people earn more money, but also like this is so you can live your best life. Money affects everyone. And so many people like are just, they, they, they're not, you know, in a secure place with their money. There's a lot of baggage around like mentality wise with money. So I get that. And so what Journey's Launch and what I want Journey's Launch to be and what I find that most people connect with my content is that this is more of like a lifestyle where it's just like, I'm not just not trying to help you find a way to budget. It's bigger than that. I want you to find a way to have freedom today. So enjoy the journey today because the journey is the longest part, but let's figure out how you can live your best life in five years, 10 years, 15 years, but enjoy your best life now. And so now I have a community of journeyers that, so if you are on this journey with me or you're trying to live your best life, then you're a journeyer, you know, like that's what it is, <laughs> non-negotiable. And I am giving you the tools, tips and resources to help you figure out a way to reach financial independence. And so there's the podcast, there's the um, launch club, which is my membership community. There's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to give as many resources for people where they can choose what, what they feel is the level that works best for them so that they can reach their their dreams. And did your business inside of your business change at all since you, you know, went out on your own full time? Is it like, did you have any staff members before? Do you have team members now? And how is that looking? So when I first started, like most, you know, side hustlers and first time entrepreneurs, I was doing everything myself um, because I was like, I can't afford to hire anyone or to do any of that. And that was great because I learned like it allowed me to like learn how to edit the podcast and all of my social media stuff like I, I did and I do mostly still. But I have since, um, you know, when I was working full time, I, I had like a VA here and there. But since uh, quitting, I now have, you know, made sure that I like have help. And so I do have a VA now. I've gone through a couple, but I think I have one that's going to work this time. And I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited about struggle, it. Right? Um, yeah. I do have an editor. Uh, so the major thing, what I learned while this with this journey is that I couldn't bog myself down with like, and I tend to do that even still. Like I find myself working on things and spending too much time doing things. I'm like, really, Jamila? Like you could have passed this along to someone else so you can work on like building the vision and like the big picture things that are going to move the business forward. Um, and so I try to now like figure out the things that I need to do versus like the things that, okay, maybe I can pass this along to my VA so they can figure yes. out how to do and help me with. So I'm, that's kind of like the stage I'm in is where I'm like now leading more into investing so I can have more time to push the business forward. And I realized that about you or the fact that you like to do things on your own or at least try it first when you, I think in one of your Instagram stories were saying how you made your own ring light at one stage. <laughs> I was like, I am I was never, just being cheap. <laughs> that never even occurred to me, you know? But now you guys, she has a, a, a ring light, a professional ring light now, but. <laughs> well, you know, so that's interesting about this whole like personal finance space. Uh -huh. I think there is a pull of like, okay, not everything, sometimes trying to like do things like that, it helps you with your skill set, right? Yeah, like yeah. you can say, wow, I built my own ring light, but it's also like not necessarily the best use of your time um, where you could be doing something else. And so I find that sometimes people try to save $5 and they ended up, they end up like spending $30 to save $5, you know, that right, kind of thing. Right, right. Um, and so it's, yeah, I remember, yeah, that I did that. I posted that story. I'm just like, okay, this is a hot mess. Like I finally <laughs> have ring light. <laughs> it is a lesson we all have to learn. So what do you think has been the most challenging 
thing in the last year as you're navigating entrepreneurship now and testing, figuring out how to monetize in a way that uh, makes sense for your business? I'd say the most just going back and forth about like picking a like a lane um, and staying committed to it to see it through. So like there's a tons of ways I could probably figure out like how to make money, like events, you know, or um, a journal or whatever. There's just like all these things that, you know, you can like easily get distracted and you want to do. And I, I find myself like because I want to do all the things mm-hmm. because I you know I feel like all these things would benefit anyone and be like a great supplement. to what they're learning via the podcast or my content that it's like important to just, you know what, pick like one thing and focus on developing that once you have that figured out then you can move on to doing something else. Um, And so I think the biggest kind of push or thing I've been focusing on is, all right, what's going to be something that you can do right now that you enjoy doing? Because I have to always remind myself that this is my business now. You know, you left the job where you kind of had to do what they wanted you to do, but now this is your business. So what do you want to do, Jamila? Um, And so it's like, but then how does that make money? But also realizing that if you operate, and so this is going to kind of sound like a little woo-woo and (laughs) um, mentality-wise, but I started saying to myself, if you know you're going to reach your goal, so you want to run, um, you want to run a million dollar business, and you want to be able to take care of your family financially, and for you guys to not be on such a tight budget. If you want to get there, that like in a certain amount of years or whatever that is, how would that person operate that knows that's going to happen today? And that person that thinks like that is not going to get too hung up on like the little things that don't work or the launches that don't work, you're just going to keep trying and like kind of keep recalibrating and fixing things. And so I think for me, that's been the biggest thing is the mindset shift to say, this is going to work. And even if it doesn't work, it's going to work kind of like that kind of like, I'm not going to lose whatever I like, no matter what I do. And that then allows me to make decisions from how I monetize. Like it just feels better. And I feel more secure in how I move about in the business. Yes. And you know, I relate to you on so many levels. I mean, Jamila and I were in a podcast like mastermind group of other podcasters together. And we, you know, we're both Jamaican, grew up in New York, like same age, I think. And so podcasters, like we're just on this similar journey. And what I relate to the most in this, like, I think we quit our jobs not too far apart from each other is just that mindset thing has been so huge. Like you, we don't have anybody else to report to anymore or to, you know, like judge our performance. So we now have to like tighten up and, and judge our performance and be like, okay, girl, like the time you just spent with this mental angst, beating yourself up (laughs) was not helpful Mm -hmm. for anything. Like let's be decisive. Let's pick a lane. Let's test. And if it doesn't work, we'll, pivot. Right, right. It's not the end of like the world. Like you be okay. Like the only things, and you know this already, Nikhil, and I, and I hope Side Hustler community knows this too. It's like, it, it only, it's only a failure if you stop, right? right. Like you, you can learn, but you just have to keep going. Exactly. It, it really, it truly, everything truly does teach you something. Even the things like, even experiences that you still look back at and are so annoyed at, like <laughs> you, you, we have to be honest with ourselves. It did teach us something. It right. did. So what would you say is next for Journey to Launch? Ooh, um, I'd say right now I am, you know, still in the foundation stages. I'm I'm developing out like the major like sources, like a content and um, like monetization, like for the business. So I'd say growing the membership, um, growing the launch club, which is the membership community is going to be probably one of my big focuses um, this year this year and then coming out with actual actual like actual products for people because I think you know people love like the content of the podcast but I think being able to like actually translate that into something they can actually execute would be even just a more benefit and like a learning guide so thinking about ways in which again not to overwhelm myself but it would be a good supplement to the podcast which is like my main source of how I get information out and also even with the launch club like thinking of ways to how I can like better serve members there and grow it to a point where like, this is like, it's like a no brainer. If you like the content of the launch of, of Journey to Launch, then like you'd love being a member of this community and learning how to reach your goals. Yes. All righty. So before we go, we're going to jump into a quick lightning round. Are you ready? I am. Okay. Number one, what is a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? I'd say the Acuity scheduling system. So <laughs> that's how I schedule all my podcast interviews. And before, you know, I used to do it via email. And now that I have that, 
it is just takes so much of like the back and forth and trying to get on people's calendars or they get on my calendar. Uh, it just takes all that out. It just seamlessly kind of streamlines everything. All right. Number two, what's been the best business book or podcast episode that you've consumed this year? So I've really been getting into the Life School, uh, the Life Coach School podcast with Brooke Castillo. And she, you know, she talks a lot about mindset stuff, but she also, because she's such a good businesswoman, like she talks about like how, like the mindset that has to shift between earning zero to a hundred thousand and from a hundred thousand to a million. And so I kind of like that, you know, as we're talking about like the mind shift and the things and what you have to believe. And she does a lot of that kind of mind work um, on the podcast. So I love it. Got to check that out. Okay. Number three, what is a non-negotiable part of your morning routine? Okay, so I don't have one because I have a 10 month old, a two year old. <laughs> we don't have routine. Like, they wake up and they run the morning. And yes. it's, it's honestly, that's been the hardest part uh, about just this whole journey because I really would love to get up and beat them to the punch and yeah. like get work done. But they wake up early every time I think I can do, try to do that. So I really at this point don't have one. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I just rolled out this new lightning round question. And of course I would roll it out to the person who's like, <laughs> ah, no, don't got it. Um, number four, what is a personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? The ability to invest in myself, even when like the money necessarily isn't like, it's not clear that the return will happen right away. Um, and so I've seen a lot of people like who are afraid to like invest in the system, right. To pay, to pay for the system or the course. And then like that kind of gets them kind of stuck. And I feel like the, my ability to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to like do this because investing in, in retirement accounts is not the only way like to, to grow and to accumulate like wealth. Like you can do that via your skill set in mind. I think being able to like see that has been really, really helpful for me. Mm. And then finally, what is your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing that steady paycheck? I'd say that it's definitely a like it's a valid concern. Um, but I like to say not necessarily leap and the the net will appear, but jump and the trampoline or bounce and the trampoline will appear kind of thing where it's just like, I don't think this is as one big leap and that's it. I think this is a continuous up and down journey. You know, there's going to be some high points, some low points. You're going to know what you're doing. You're not going to know what you're doing. And so to just stick with it because all those moments of insecurity, all those moments of you don't know what you're doing, crying or whatever it is, like it's going to happen. But the only way that you don't reach your goals is if you just stop. So just don't stop. Just keep going, keep bouncing and things will become clearer for you. I think that might be one of my favorite ones. I like that. <laughs> You're so right. Like, it's not like this big leap. Woo, I'm an entrepreneur. It's yeah. like bounce, bounce. Like, oh, that didn't go well. <laughs> right. Like today is great. Oh, no, today I don't know. What oh, I'm doing. no. Oh, yeah, that didn't work. So um, where can people connect with you? Find out about the Launch Club, listen to Journey to Launch and all of that good stuff. Yeah, so you can find me wherever you listen to this podcast. So the Journey to Launch podcast is everywhere. Um, you can go to journeytolaunch.com. I'm also on all social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as journeytolaunch.com. And then if you want to check out the Launch Club, you can go to journeytolaunch.com slash launch club and see what the community is like. All right. Well, Jamila, thank you so much for being in the guest chair. This was awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Nikayla. It was an honor. And there you have it. 